This is Michael Osterlink. Welcome to O Radio, where we explore individual and social transformation through collaborative action. I'm a psychotherapist with a transpersonal and somatic specialization. I'm also a transpartisan social entrepreneur, head instructor at Silfitz and Beautiful Mind Academy, executive coach at Spartan 7, and director of human resilience at Aperion Zoo. Today's show is brought to you by somaticpsychotherapytoday.com, an online resource for all topics related to body-oriented psychology. Today's guest is Dr. D. Joy Coulter, who is a nationally recognized neuroscience educator known for her unique ability to present complex ideas in clear and humorous ways that are useful for our audience. She's the author of the book, Original Mind, Uncovering Your Natural Brilliance, published by Sounds True. For the past year, she has produced free weekly short podcasts offering her insights into brain and how to develop our natural brilliance. Both the book and the podcast are available at embraceyourbrain.com. Her background includes a master's degree in special education from the University of Michigan and a doctorate in neurological studies and holistic education from the University of Northern Colorado. Hello, 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 Dee. Hi. How are you? I'm just fine. Welcome back to O Radio. Thank you. So today we're going to talk about the level of cognitive complexity necessary to understand and deal with appropriately the C-19 virus. So why don't we just start with you know, some general ideas that you might have. And obviously the level of complexity is different for different types of people that are necessary to deal with the different situations they find themselves in. But if you can make some broad generalizations and maybe we can get particular from there, we can start there. Sure. Uh, one of the things that struck me <clears throat> a while back was that our country didn't seem to have a grasp on a notion called period doubling. And that's why we missed out on the first round of being able to intercept everything. If we look at South Korea, I think their first day was the same as our first day, January 21st. And within two weeks, they used uh, 100,000 test kits because they wanted to get out ahead and that was the way to figure out where it was and where it was traveling and how fast. And that way they could figure out who to sequester and when. We didn't have the test kits, nor did we have that idea of using it as a preventive advanced scout. So the first time it dawned on our system that, oh my gosh, this isn't just an addition problem, is it? Was when we started getting jumps in the numbers. And that's the period that we're talking about. It doubled. It kept doubling. And the question is, well, how fast is it doubling? And if we can slow down the speed of the doubling, then we can buy enough time and we don't end up totally crashing the medical system, for one thing. It's a little bit like um, going viral on the, on the web. We could have a site that was really popular. And then we look at the clicks if it was going to go viral. And at first there'd be just a few clicks and then there'd be a chunk more and a chunk more. And if we looked at the numbers, we'd see that they were doubling at a certain speed. And at some point they might get so huge before tapering off and people losing interest that it crashed that site. And that's our biggest concern. We don't want to crash the medical system. So we didn't know about the period doubling. We weren't tracking it. The epidemiologists were, but that's about the level of it. Um, and so now what we have to do is kind of, I could call it feed forwarding, but in a funny sort of a way, you have to go backwards. I mean, we put an astronaut on the moon almost 60 years ago and we did it. I don't know if you ever, well, I'm kind of old. So I saw those charts. <laughs> they would fill a room, the charts of what to do and when to do it. Because first they thought about being on the moon and then they figured out, okay, there has to be a suit that's on the moon and there has to be a, a nose cone that's on the, on the uh, rocket that's on the moon. And so they went backwards and, the, and they would think about things like, well, we don't know how to make those suits. We don't know how to make them airtight. And so they, they'd mark down that we better figure that out about five months out. And then they thought, well, we have to have a heat shield on the nose cone that doesn't burn up when it's, when it's shooting through the space like that. And so 
what can we do? And they didn't have any alloy that they could put on that nose cone at the time. So they moved back on their timeline and said, well, that better start now. And we have to get some lab assigned to figuring out what kind of an alloy could come, they could come up with to do that. And that's the kind of thinking they were doing. They took the end point and then they worked backwards. If we were going to be doing advanced planning before there was an epidemic or a pandemic, we would do that. And there are some plans that did do that, that did look backwards like that. But by the time we figured out those would be good things to look at, it was too late for that. So now we're trying to scramble and catch up with things that are in short supply. Uh, so that's what we're doing now is we're doing the feed forward, trying to say, what do you need? When do you need it? And the worst case scenario is what we're also doing. I need it now. Where is it? There isn't any. What do you mean they're not making those things? So that, that's kind of what the task is. Our brains are getting exhausted on every level, politically and, and epidemiology and medically and logistically. It's like we, we should be a giant procurement officer, you know, and we're not quite getting a grip on how to do that. So what I hear you saying is one of the possible lessons learned, if in fact we as a species in general or Americans in particular learn our lessons, would be to project out into the future and then work backwards to solve uh, the problems into the future. Um, <clears throat> in order to do that, it, what is required of us in terms of brain and mind development to have that level of thinking that we can do that? Oh, nice question. Um, there's several things and it involves the body. That's the funny thing. Um, we have one thing that we're well aware of. You're doing it, I'm doing it, anybody listening is doing it. We have out loud speech and we also have this voice going on inside, editing and planning and preparing what's gonna come off of our tongue next. Uh, we would call that inner speech. And it guides things like writing papers and planning arguments. And sometimes it doesn't have a monitor and it doesn't guard our tongue. So we say things that we wish we hadn't. But the inner <laughs> speech under stress does a lot of interesting things too. It, it starts sounding like a younger age because when we're under stress, our brain kind of downshifts. And maybe we're using a brain that was fantastic when we were seven or 12 or something. And, and then we could find out what we've done if we could listen to that inner speech instead of let it drive our day. Um, and we need to do that. And we could talk about that in a bit. But when you're looking at the question at hand, how to solve the logistics problems, how to look at supply chains, try to figure out what's gone wrong with our economy that we weren't ready for this, how has it changed? We almost have to use a physical sense that's not inner speech. I think I'd call it inner gesture, like the period doubling. If you had a feel for how those numbers can cascade, you know, if you'd been watching avalanches or floods or things going viral or fire patterns even, we would get the idea of how things escalate. When they use the word it's exponential, that's another way of putting it, that it's, it's moving at speeds that accumulate and build up very quickly. Out here, the avalanches, they take like five seconds. By the time they're down at the bottom of a, of a run, they're going 60 to 80 miles an hour. That is enormously fast, period doubling. And we'd like to see things be slower, but we have to get a felt sense people that really have a feel for numbers, and I wish we taught math that way, um, can think about these things without uh, getting overly taxed in the head because <laughs> the body can help us along. It, it's a choreography. It's really a felt sense choreography. Can you break that down a little bit? Because I have to imagine uh, many in our listening audience would get thinking about it, perhaps seeing it visually, but how do you feel something like something that's exponential like that? Well, typically we'll say somebody has auditory and visual and kinesthetic skills. Mm -hmm. So part of it, we have a memory that goes like that. Um, we are aware that we remember what we've seen maybe or what we've heard or 
I would be a great case in point that I could look at somebody's face and think, I think I recognize them. <clears throat> I'm not going to be able to call up their name. But if they do anything, if they move differently, if they clear their throat, all of a sudden they come back up because I've got them stored on my body. I have a kinesthetic sense that's really good. And if I hear somebody describe a situation, up come five or six other people I have known who had that situation. Uh, so I count on my kinesthetic memory that has mapped everything and has coordinates physically to bring everything back up. And when it comes to numbers, we're often taught to memorize, but if you have a crummy memory, <laughs> at one point I did a study of this, especially with, with girls that tended to bail on math pretty quickly, usually by eighth grade, and I would have these large classes of teachers I would teach, and I was always asking, how many are really good at math? And most of the teachers in my classes were female. And so there would be some that would raise their hands. And then I'd say, so how's your memory? And almost invariably, they said, it's awful, as was mine for anything mathematical. So what we did instead, the ones that had crummy memories, we had to use reason. And we had to get a felt sense for what's going on here. I've probably invented algebra 10,000 times because I need it periodically. And I have to come up with it again, but I've got a felt sense for how numbers behave. And so it's no big deal. If we were good at memory, chances are we just stored it as a memory thing. Thought it's nothing. But you talk to anybody who loves math, the physicists, they, they have a felt sense. And they get how things move and how things move in relation to each other. It's almost like they're watching a dance or something. So I don't know if that helps. No, it does. And I'd actually be curious if they're able to map the body, how that shows up outside of brainwave activities in the, in the, in the brain itself, you know, as someone's feeling into um, a mathematical problem or as we're just talking about, like the exponential growth of a particular, this gets virus or whatever. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm curious, uh, yeah, has anyone ever well, tried to map that on the physical body? We're getting a lot closer because mm -hmm. what we're having, you know, for a long time, we just looked at the brain as structure. And then if somebody was damaged in a particular area, we say, well, what can't you do now? Well, that must be then what that brain part did. That's mm -hmm. not the greatest assumption to make. Right. I remember teaching in a, a junior high where if the, if the kids acted out, they could be sent out of class to the office. And what would happen to them is they'd have to hang out with the assistant principal because he was really good at handling problems like that. Well, at one point they decided that this school didn't have enough kids. They didn't need an assistant principal. And the teachers all panicked because, oh my gosh, now what are we gonna do if the kids are acting out and we can't handle the class and that kid? Well, it worked out just fine because the janitor was also really good at working with kids. So the kids were hanging out with the janitor. Well, after a while, the, the halls weren't as clean as they used to be because the janitor was too busy. Now, you could say, oh, the assistant principal must have been cleaning the halls because that's what's missing now. But the brain tends to pinch hit like that too. So if you've got an area that's, that's damaged, and you can't say that the function you can't do is because of that. It could be that another area gave up its function to take on this more important task. So it's very confusing if you try to go by structure. So then they started to go by wiring, you know, they could do EEGs. And, right, could do, right. um, and that was okay, that was okay, but it was just finding out where something was going on, some charge was going on. It was very, very uh, crude. But now we're looking at networks from the big data of mapping the entire brain. And so now they're coming up with things like, you know, there's this cluster sort of at the back of the brain that fires whenever anybody is doing fast forwarding. And you think, yeah, I know that feeling. It's like when you're looking at something and you're picturing down the road, it could happen this way or that way, a basketball player, for instance, going down the court and having to hand the ball off 
he's he's upgrading or she's upgrading where all the teammates are at at any one time so when they throw the ball they know exactly where everybody is and where they're going to be by the time the ball gets there too lots of fast forwarding of a lot of data and we know we can do this but isn't it cool to think we've got a particular network they know exactly where it is and they watch it when somebody is actually doing that and if somebody can't do fast forwarding or they've never discovered that network then maybe we could coach them into well here's what it feels like or here's some examples or here's some exercises that you got to have it for and we could begin to boot up some of these networks that we haven't been putting into place yet well, that's actually my next question for you so you know I, my take on c19 is this is a test case i mean it's a horrible one but it's a yeah. test case of us as individuals how fragile we all are our institutions and our various systems and that we will have many more, even more painful tests down the road. So I think we need to rethink many things. So I'm curious if that's in fact true, or if we just speak to C19. You know, if you're looking at the next generation of children who will turn into adults and then be dealing with these next rounds of, of global challenges, how can you create this ways of thinking and being in the world so they can then address these global very complex challenges? Well, I think we're seeing it already. Okay. Um, we've got a whole generation or two that probably never learned how to cook. And <laughs> now they're learning how to cook True. because they can't go out to the restaurants. I, I don't think I'd like to be in the restaurant business because it may not fire up like it used to be because people are going to say, wait a minute, I don't have to go out for brunch. I can fix a really good brunch. Um, so we'll have to see how that plays out. The idea of raising organic food is getting awfully interesting to people. I have some horses, so I end up going to feed stores and normally the feed stores carry baby chicks this time of the year. Well, people are buying them up right and left. They never had baby chicks. They're trying to raise their own chickens now. So these are skills that, you know, the people that have been in the organic movement forever, and the locavores, please eat local foods, and so on. They've been beating their head against the wall trying to get people to do these things, but now they are doing them. So we're going to come out of this in a lot of different ways. There's some terribly tragic things happening in the world of events, but we're coming out of it probably with some skills we never thought we'd cultivate, and, and that's hopeful. And we're also discovering that an awful lot of things that we thought had to be in person don't so that maybe we're not going to have to fly halfway across the country to have meetings because we're having to do it this other way now and we're discovering you know it works just fine so and we're going to have generations of kids that i mean they already were running circles around us with their tech skills but now everybody's catching up because it's the only thing to do so we're going to come out of it with a set of skills we didn't used to have and they may hold us in good stead we're going to be eating in a little more healthy way. Um, people are willing to have vegetables now. Salads <laughs> are pretty good because you can't have any. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't think we have to become brilliant physicists. We just have to get back in our bodies. Because our body, I, I've looked at what indigenous people know. Mm -hmm. And it blows you away. They are wonderful systems thinkers because they stay in their bodies. And so say more, say, please say more about that. So how, how, how would you say that an indigenous gosh, person they, is a system thinker because they're able to stay inside their body? Because when they look out at nature, they, um, the Buddhists have an expression, it's called exchange self for other. And we might say matching or empathy or um, connecting or compassion, but feeling, getting, it's not emotional, it's a felt sense, a felt sense of our surroundings. We have certain things that even if we're kind of dense, we get. I, I've heard people over and over talking about walking up to the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C., for instance, and they can feel it. Eight, you know, yards ahead of time. 
before they get there. They feel the energy of that monument. So there are some, and we go into a church or we go into a synagogue or we go into a temple or we go into a library and we can feel the energy that has been practiced in those spaces. It affects us. It makes, it's easier to think in a library than it is um, in a cafe perhaps. Although writing is good in a cafe. <laughs> so I think we're going to be more in our bodies again because we can't, we can't get away from it. We're stuck. We're sequestered also with our bodies. And so we could begin to cultivate a level of brilliance we didn't know we had. So I like to explore that a little bit more, but let me ask you a question. So because I found cause as a society, and I'm going to use 9-11 as a reference, that there seems to be, and this can be very binary, so it might not be so binary, but I'll put it in binary terms. When you have a tragic incident like that that affects you know so many people, what, either whether directly or indirectly, um, that there seems to be two choices. One is to devolve and tap into less complex areas of the brain or brain, brain, mind, brain, mind. Mm -hmm. um, so less ability to use reason, less executive function. Um, or you can s notice that some people kind of use a, a tragedy or a crisis to, to jump to the next stage. If you want to use stages, if that's appropriate of complexity in your thinking, some people seem to fall back to less complex ways of thinking, some people move forward. Would you, so let me ask you that. Is that something that you would agree with? And if not, I'd be curious why. And so then I'll follow up with my question. Well, um, there are two things to look at there. One would be the stress level. Mm -hmm. Under stress, we do fall back. We downshift is a term that Richard Restack coined a long time ago. It's a nice one. Um, but we can catch ourselves and say, wait, this isn't working. <clears throat> okay, I got to get my act together. I got to think about it better, maybe sleep on it, and then maybe we can bounce back. We have varying degrees of tolerance for resilience, for ambiguity, and the ambiguity is what's behind the resilience. If we don't mind things being unclear for a while, then we have more resilience. Um, I noticed when I was teaching kids that the ones who had a short fuse, who got frustrated easily, had a much harder, harder time learning math, for instance, mm. because math had to be confusing until it wasn't. So you say, I don't get it, I don't get it, I don't get it, I get it. And as long as you have pressed on through and you got to where you did get the payoff of, oh, I got it, then the next time you're willing to put up with confusion a little longer, and the confusion ends up being ambiguity tolerance, which ends up being resilience. Um, and we all have to learn that. So it's not that some people go one way or the other. Some situations are so impinging on them that they don't have the luxury of uh, panning back and taking a look at it because they don't have enough safety to do anything but take care of their safety. And that is a much more primitive thing. You know, we're not supposed to commit suicide while thinking. <laughs> so. Right. If we're not safe, we've got to take care of that first. So kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yeah. Something along those lines. Communicates to the listener very much, but um, but yeah, the I accept. Let me explain that enough that people could follow it because it is. Please. He ended up looking at the idea that the very base of a pyramid was, you provide for your safety, and then you provide for. I guess it was relationships and achievement and then he had higher order thinking but he went beyond that he said but there's a point where ha where you have a sense of i don't know if he used the word spirituality but where you have a sense of the basic goodness of life itself and then you don't have those stages anymore then everything makes sense everything is kind of connected interesting when you get that sense of connectivity it's not that some people understand it and some don't some have had experiences and they put their finger on it and others maybe it's hard to imagine going through life and never had any had a moment 
where all was one, where all was okay. Um, they could be miracle moments like when a baby was born or mm. moments in a, in a high ceremony of some kind, a, a wedding or a, um, making something sacred, sacred spaces, whether they're religious spaces or energetic spaces that the indigenous world picked up on that we're gravitating to, but we don't know why. Um, but we have a moment where there isn't a point of view. We don't have a point of view. We can't say we're standing here looking at that, making a judgment. Instead, there's a sense of looking at it from all points of view at the same time, having a, a global panoramic, it's, it's really holographic, a holographic take on what's going on. And holograms are really different and the brain can do that. We can shift into that state. And if we begin to cultivate those things, we can remember that that's the place from which to make a judgment. And then we can act with a broader basis. So let's actually, this would be a good segue to talk about cultivating some of the capacities um, that would help us not only survive something like C-19, but thrive in these kind of conditions and make us more resilient as a people and then help hopefully generate institutions and systems that reflect that resilience or the anti-fragility down the road for the next series of crisis, which will hit us if not soon, then in the near future. So, you know, if you were working with a group of people who said to you, D, help us to develop some of these capacities, what would you recommend to them? Are we talking about adults or children? Are we well, talking let's, about literate start, or non-literate populations? Let's start with uh, adults, uh, generally literate. That's the hardest group, of course. Um, Okay, let's start with children. <laughs> okay. We'll go from easier to harder. Yeah, well, it's easier with the children because uh, they're already there until we talk them out of it. Um, before our brain gets literate, it can do this panoramic exchange self for other kind of thinking quite easily. And once we become literate, different, different networks kick in and make it harder to get back to where we saw the connectivities. I mean, little kids, I'm sure they're seeing all sorts of energy fields, not just the event world. They see lights and energy around people. They can sense who's a bad person and a good person. They stay away from the bad people. It's their way of taking care of themselves. They're unconscious about it. Um, and then once they get literate, then they start being more analytical about things and they kind of lose some of those intuitive skills. It, when you see the transitions, you know, like around five or six years old, you get the kids that there's a rainbow and they get really excited <laughs> when, when a grown up points out the rainbow, rainbow because they think, wow, there's finally something that I see that you can see. And they're thrilled that we can see the rainbows, but that's the extent of what we can see. And they're busy watching lights like rainbows all over the place, I think. Um, so we teach them we teach them literacy and we teach them a disembodied brain things, you know, sort of a, mm -hmm. how, to, how to think without bringing your body along. But the thing is, if we're going to do higher order thinking, like systems thinking, now we can't do it unless we bring the body back in because we have to map the patterns on the body and watch how they move. We have to get a felt sense for the dynamics, like the basketball player. Mm -hmm. Ideas move like that too, and we have to watch how they could play out. And the fast forwarding that we're able to do doesn't run one idea, it runs a jillion of them at once, and then we choose one. So we're constantly dis displaying patterns. If we're doing it physically, because our body can, oh man, that reminds me of Elise Boulding. She, she was an incredible woman. The Quakers nominated her for the Nobel Peace Prize at one point. She worked with a lot of indigenous people and she said she was always amazed at the minds of the women in the marketplace because they didn't do any writing down of what was needed or what was to be bought, but they would bring the right amount of whatever it was, onions or tomatoes or, or 
burning, you know, sticks for burning or whatever it was they were gathering and bringing to the market to sell, they knew exactly how much they were going to need. They knew who was going to show up that day and how much they needed last time. It was all in their heads. And she said she discovered that there's a level of feeling for complexity that we can achieve through the use of our own bodies. And that's what they taught her, that they had it mapped on their bodies. They didn't have it written down. And then we come along with microfinance and we teach them to write it all down so that it's just like becoming literate, you become numerate, and then you lose some of those skills. We, we never look at what we give up when we make these quasi advances. Um, and we have to go back and get some of those. I, when I wrote my book, I spent a huge chunk of time revisiting the indigenous mind because the things that they are able to do, and most of them can still do it even though they're liter literate because they maintain their cultural practices that arose during those earlier times. So they've got both things going. Um, and so I was looking at what are their skills? How could we learn some of those? just different activities and different exercises that people could reclaim some of that. Because I think we, we need to look at this planet as something other than products to be exploited for one generation. And that's another thing we're going to see that, wait a minute, we're going to run out of X, Y, and Z. And we have a, this radical distribution of wealth, which is being modified a bit now. Um, that's based on consumption but maybe we're not going to be so caught up with consumption. I mean, how many people are planning a cruise <laughs> coming up? You know, it's just, we're not going to run around just doing pleasure things as much, I think, as we did before. You know, I'd love to have a, another conversation. So I'm going to invite you back right now <laughs> on kind of the misuse of the term civilization as we compare and contrast ourselves to the quote unquote primitive people. Um, because I think that's a misnomer and problematic. And you just, you started explaining to us how the indigenous folks, even with the rational Western approach on top of them, still retain some of these amazing skills and capacities, which will serve us in the West today for our own survival not only survival, but thriving. But I think we'll save that for a longer, yeah. another conversation. And yet you can watch with science research, especially in the biological sciences and in the environmental sciences, that they're beginning to pair up with indigenous wise elders to have more than one way to look at the dynamics that they're looking at, yeah. maybe migrations of elk in Canada, for instance. But so, so we're beginning to realize that now that we are learning how to do this thinking, <laughs> we can have conversations with them again. Right. Because they, they never let it go. Thank God. Yeah. That's right. Sure. So, but, so let's talk about some of the, you, you mentioned in your book that there's some practices that could help individuals. In this case, we're talking about children, but we can transition to and talk about children and adults. If you do make a distinction, just make sure you, explain who you're speaking of yeah but like what kind of practices would you would you encourage children to do to amplify the skills they already possess and what might when what practices might you recommend adults maybe even for the first time for 20 30 40 50 years uh do to amplify some of their lost skills or m minimal yeah. skills that well, they lost in a funny point. sort of a way if we could if we could remove the the risk factors out of the lives of children so that they, they felt safe and they felt cared for um, and they felt free to play. I'm not too worried about their cultivating or retaining their skills. Nice. Maybe we should look at the adults. <laughs> okay. No, that's, that's perfect. And I, I'm reminded of, you know, some of these really interesting movements. Um, I like the book free to play as an example, uh -huh. but even some of the unschooling movement, uh, out there recognize yeah. some of the things that you're speaking to and having met some children who are actually now adults who were unschooled mm -hmm. compared to children who went to conventional schools it's fascinating to see the differences in emotional intelligence and various ways of thinking about the world and stuff the one thing that i think um is missing if if that's all we did um 
civilization has come up with some rather interesting things like like mathematics and physics and like literature and and like logic symbolic logic and so we have come up with things that are worth learning and that is going to require a level of will a level of practice and the ability to practice instead of i did that already or i'm not enjoying this and therefore i won't do it and that's one of the the drawbacks is oh well, if you don't want to do it don't do it then you have no then you have no will then you don't have the practice effect because if you're good at something you can think back to when you weren't so good at it but for some reason you were willing to go through the wood shedding sometimes we call it in music <laughs> you're willing to pay the dues mm -hmm. and you do it and do it until you've mastered it until it's part of your makeup it's no longer something you're learning you're just doing it um you know you just put again i, I thought of a buddhist term because i taught at a buddhist university and they would they would call it a practice they call it the dharma you there was a wonderful calligrapher and she she was able to create a, a calligraphic poster at the same time that a group was inventing a spontaneous poem. She didn't have to think about it and then design it. She was doing it on the spot. And people asked her, Lori, how do you do that? And she said, well, I've been doing calligraphy for so long that the Dharma, the practice is in my hands. And so it makes me think too of they were, they were interviewing this, these uh, tap dancers from the Cotton Club era, way back. And they were watching different tap dancers and commenting on them. And they hit this one guy that he was so good and they'd run out of adjectives. And they looked at that guy and they said, that guy has thinking feet. Same thing, his feet knew what to do. With the calligrapher, her hands knew what to do. When we take something in really deeply, we've inwardly formed our nature and we have a skill that we couldn't get any short of that. That ability to practice until, un, until we have a practice, it's different. You're practicing and having a practice, but there's a point where practicing becomes a practice that organizes us. And I hate to think that a child wouldn't cultivate that. And you, see, you do see that in indigenous cultures. Each one has a skill that they feel obliged to apprentice others to and move through until they have the mastery level. That piece is critical for all of us. It makes complete sense. So let's uh, move from the kids um, to adults. You know, assuming, assuming that uh, the conditions are, the conditions are not perfect, but are better for children to grow up and having not had their innate capacities blocked off and, and broken down by culture, uh, you know, by industrial Western civilization. Um, let's just talk about adults who are, you know, ensconced in this culture, in this Western civilization. They've lost a lot of these capacities or they're diminished. You know, how would you work with someone, someone's like them to help them rekindle these in these capacities, which you are talking about, the indigenous folks naturally have and express themselves regularly. Oh man, I I have several thoughts that went on. <laughs> Let's see, I did a fast forward on the question. Um, so you have to discover that you have that physical way of knowing. Um, one of the things you could do is look among your the objects in your life. There might be some that you treasure, that if there were a fire, you'd hope you grabbed that and took it out with you because it meant something to you. Well, it means something because it has some energy to it. And you could even test the energy. Sometimes they like to just, okay, hold it in one hand, put your arm straight out off to your side and have somebody push down on your wrist fairly fairly firmly, but not meanly or anything, and just see whether or not you're able to hold your arms straight out like that when you're holding this very special object to you. 
Um, you could do that with your jewelry. Why is it I, I have this thing, it was given to me, it's really important and I don't like it and I never wear it. Well, if you tested that, you'd find you can't hold your arm up. It's just, it's, it has no energy for you. And other things that aren't as special, you wear them a lot because it does have energy for you. Little kids will do that. They'll be playing, they're looking at all, all the tools that you might have. And they're gonna go for the one that was your grandfather's and is very special and they don't go for the shiny new one you got from the hardware store because it doesn't have any energy. And if we begin to recognize that, oh, we do have a felt sense for things. We just didn't slow down enough to notice what's twitching inside, you know? Right, and right. That felt sense. Um, another is to hang out with kids in a way that I used to have people take a silent walk with a kid that was five or three, four, five. That's a good age. By the time they're seven or eight, they get kind of mental on you. <laughs> <laughs> but you take a, a silent walk where you don't yak and yak and point out like a tour guide all the things in, in the neighborhood, you just back off and you can answer the question so it doesn't seem scary and weird to the kid if they ask something, but mostly they're gonna walk around the neighborhood and they're gonna point out things. They may hunker down and check the cigarette butts or something, or they're looking at, they're, you're coming up on a dog and they'll tell you that's a nice dog, or don't go near that dog, he bites. They, they've got the whole dog kingdom scoped out. Um, and they'll tell you what is going on in that neighborhood. You don't have to ask them and they will become totally engrossed. One, I, they would write up these reports and I'd get to read them and they were just hysterical. Like sometimes they'd go to a park and this kid would jump off of a bench and then he'd get on and he'd jump off again and he'd jump off again. Finally, after a while, I'd say, see, same place every time. <laughs> and they didn't know they were watching an experiment. And then another time there'd be a kid that was throwing pebbles into a ditch or into a creek and kept doing that and doing that. And finally he looked over and said, you know, if you ever stop, the ripples are going to die. Well, that was difficult for a parent that has very little frustration tolerance and patience. They're going to be there forever. Otherwise the ripples are going to die. That's how they're seeing it. And if we got into the child's mind, instead of trying always to get them into our mind, that's a great practice too. Color, color, the difference between, if you go to a real art museum and you might have seen a print of a painting, but if you see the real painting, you can feel the brush stroke because the paint is showing you the stroke that the artist used. And so there's the rhythm and the energy as well as the image. And there are just chances like that all over for us to to get the energetic side, not just the event side. I love that. That's fantastic. Um, and I know one of the other areas uh, that you work with clients on, and I've listened to you talk about, is breath. Um, maybe we could kind of finish this part of the conversation off. And is there a breath practice that you might recommend people to get more in touch with their body, as an example, and learn to manage their internal states? <laughs> <clears throat> right now, yeah, there was the, <laughs> one of the podcasts I just recently did, uh, and I'm, I'm going in a direction that I'll probably get crucified for, but it's, it's just, there's a way to look at the ages we go back to, and when we go back under stress, we're, we're not functioning very well, but it's interesting because those are also ages that we got huge gifts from that we're using all our lives, and when we're beside ourselves, we're, we're freaked out and stressed. As, as we all get, you know, I, I don't suppose there's anybody that's making it through their whole day without stressing out, unless they're creating some psychotic delusional system that tells them everything's fine, in which case that's pretty stressed out too. So let's just assume everybody has these lapses and we're trying to figure out how to catch the lapse instead of just live it. Because when we're living it, we're sure that's reality. And we're, we can't tell that it isn't reality unless we change our breath. The chances are the way we're breathing when we're under stress is a lot of held breaths and a big emphasis on the in-breath. And in order to shift, we have to start focusing on the out-breath. And I'm figuring that no matter where anybody's sequestered, the one thing you're pretty sure of is there's got to be a bathroom in there somewhere. So you go into the bathroom and you shut the door. It's the only really private thing you may have right now and start just breathing out. 
you know, your air is going to come in again. But you focus on just breathing out and breathing out and breathing out until finally you're relaxed enough that, yeah, that inner speech is still yickety yakking along telling you what's real, but start listening to it instead of following it. And all of a sudden, it's got some complaints. It's, it's sounding kind of nine-like or seven-like, and you wouldn't necessarily know the ages, but it's, it's got a whiny kid-like thing about it. It's not happy. And so you begin to say, okay, now that I got the feel, what would you like? What is going to comfort you? Maybe they want a back rub. Maybe they need a nap. Maybe they want a cup of cocoa. Maybe they want something that isn't scary, or maybe they want to do dress up or something. It, there's no tell what, what's going to be satisfying that part of us. It, it could be that you get this funny, vague feeling that inside part of you is continuously crying. I just think of that as baby crying. And when you're getting that feeling of just, it, you can't even put your finger out what's the matter. It's just, you're just miserable, wretched. Well, maybe it is the baby part crying. Well, then you need to make sure it stays warm and you need to make sure that it's comforted and probably give it some cocoa. You know, what, do you, what would you do for a baby? You make sure they never got cold. Um, and so you take good care of that. You might feel like, gee, we're all in this alone, aren't we? Well, you probably have a ring somewhere that you could use as a friendship ring. And you could put it on and say, no, I'm not alone. I have a friend. It's me. So we could do things like that, but we can't get at it unless we breathe out enough that we hear the voice that's driving us instead of run around letting it drive us. That's fantastic. And I think that's a great exercise for folks to start doing as a way to reconnect with themselves, as well as create some distance from that, that voice and, and uh, realize that it's something that they can approach and not be driven by, as well as then nourish themselves in that process. Um, so D, how can people learn more about your work, your book, your podcast, uh, any written materials that you have? blogs and such? Well, the podcasts are, they're easy. They're anywhere that they have podcasts. It's just called embraceyourbrain.com and they're free and they're short. I figure everybody's got a short attention span these days. So I try to keep it close to five minutes. They're creeping up just like seven or eight minutes these days because it's, these are complicated ideas. Um, and I'm trying to make them simple. I'm trying to make them interesting and certainly not depressing. Um, so they just come out every week, roughly Monday night, Tuesday morning, somewhere in there. Um, they can go to my website, embraceyourbrain.com, and see them there. I have blogs, too. I, I hate blogs. I don't know why I'm doing them. Someone said I was supposed to do blogs, and I'm all right already. <laughs> I'll put something out once a month, something about how the brain works. So there are blogs that you can look at if, if they strike your fancy. And they're only one page long, too. Um, and they're on the website. Everything's free on the website, except for the book itself. Um, and then there's some talks. I used to give a lot of talks around the country and sometimes I really liked it. So I kept it. And now I've got MP3s of some of those talks. Um, Excellent. But mostly it's just, I, I don't know why I'm doing the podcast. It's just, it's what I can offer at this point in my life. And, and it's amazing how much energy it takes for me to pull together something worth anybody's time to listen. Well, I must say, I'm glad you're doing it. <laughs> Let me encourage folks to listen to your podcast, to check out your book, and even read your blog posts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. D. Coulter, thank you for joining me today, and I look forward to another conversation in the near future. You bet. Thanks a lot, Michael. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.